want to, because some of these ideas are kind of new, um, uh, new to new to me, and I think uh, uh, new in the, the the field of what's called analytic biology. And this is it could be this is in particular analytic Christian theology, but but analytic theology in general could be analytic blah theology. And all this is is taking methods from analytic philosophy and trying to clarify things in the given theology. As I've said to um, uh, others, I, I've actually come to really believe that what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is on the right track. Um, uh, so this isn't, me. so a lot of stuff that I've done um, and that maybe a lot of us do in philosophy is we take ideas and we try to make them precise and we try to model them. Um, and that's sort of the way this, this started out. But I've actually come to really believe that if there is a true Christian theology, a true Christian worldview that's fairly orthodox, it's going to be this one. Okay? Anyway, um, as a result of some of these things being a little new, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to do a combination of, I'm going to read a little bit from the, from the paper just so that I stay on track. Um, and then in some parts, I'll talk a little bit. I take it that some of the ideas in logic are very familiar um, in the Institute here. So on that assumption, I'm going to sort of say very little about some of the logic. I'll wave at it. I'll highlight the important points. But I'm not going to go into a lot. Half of the paper is actually the logic stuff, but here I don't think I need to do that a whole lot. Um, but ask questions if I do. If there's something that's unclear, you're more than welcome to stop me. It's better that we're all here, not just sitting here lost. Um, so please feel free to interrupt. All right. That's the plan. So I'm going to read a little bit before turning to this. Um, OK. Uh, so the, the, pro, the title of the paper is Christ a Contradiction, a Defense of Contradictory Christology. Uh, I begin with two quotes, just they set things up nicely. One uh, by Alan Back, uh, quote, the doctrine of the incarnation has long perplexed believers and non-believers alike. What is perplexing is the paradoxical appearance of an incarnate God who is supposed to be omnipotent. Christ is supposed to be God, and yet also is supposed to have a finite corporeal body, feel pain, and have other properties of us creatures, whereas God is supposed to be none of these things." Unquote. Here's another quote related uh, by um, C.J.F. Williams. Quote, there's a point at which the student of Christology becomes a student of logic, a point at which the student has to make use of the concept of incompatibility and entailment, a point at which the student has to answer a charge of self-contradiction, unquote. All right, so this paper aims to do two things. The, the paper first attempts to free Christian theology from what I think is a mi misguided view of logic. Um, I think they just sort of, theologians are like many other theorists. They just sort of, when they think of logic, they just look at whatever the standard theory is and they say, okay, that's logic. Um, but I think that this is, uh, you know, what the standard logic is, is so uh, narrow. And it's, it's, it's been built out of a very narrow um, class of phenomena uh, that, that it's, it's just not very informed to think that the standard view of logic really is the right account of logic. So the first uh, aim in this paper is to try to um, help theology see that logic isn't as constrained as they think, okay? I'm not going to say tons about that, but I will say something. The second part uh, 
is to advance and defend a view of contradictory Christology. Um, okay? All right. So everything begins with, with what has been called the fundamental problem of Christology. The fundamental problem of Christology is the apparent contradiction of Christ's having two apparently complementary, that is, contradiction entailing natures, the divine nature and the human nature. This problem may be sharpest for what's called conciliar Christology, which is endorsed by Orthodox Catholicism. You take the ecumenical councils and what they said about the, the Christian scriptures, and you take those councils as orthodox, as defining the position. So the fundamental problem may be more may be pressing for conciliar Christology, but the prima facie problem is clear for any orthodox or traditional Christianity, according to which Christ has two apparently complementary natures. So here is one uh, simple uh, version of an instance of the fundamental problem. Um, so we have that uh, Christ cannot suffer um, in virtue of Christ's, uh, this is just shorthand for, for Christ's uh, divine nature. Um, this, by the way, uh, comes directly from the conciliar uh, text. The conciliar texts say that the divine nature involves being uh, impassable in a certain way. Uh, they're explicit about this, and one thing that's ruled out by impassibility is the ability to suffer. Um, and you can, get, you can get more narrow notions of suffering if you want, but certainly part of the uh, traditional theistic concept of the divine nature is one where uh, suffering is ruled out. All right, then the other one is Christ can suffer in virtue of Christ's human nature. Uh, again, according to the, uh, the, the doctrine, um, this figure, Christ, has two distinct natures. One is divine, one is human, and everything that's entailed by these natures is had by this object, Christ. Um, therefore, Christ can and cannot uh, suffer. So this is a contradiction. This is supposed to follow by logic. Um, okay. So that's an example. That, that, that alone is not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem comes from having these two apparently complementary natures, and they uh, so a heresy is if you say, well, there are really two Christs. There's the divine Christ who has all these divine properties and the human Christ who has all these human properties. That would resolve the problem because you wouldn't, it wouldn't be contradictory. You'd have two different people. Heresy, bad, ruled out. And driven, by the way, by the fundamental problem. That heresy arose, the idea that there are really two Christs, um, that arose in response to the apparent contradiction. And almost all of the other uh, heresies arose from the same thing, from the tension of you have this apparent contradiction at the heart of this worldview. Okay? All right. So the history of Christian theology, and in particular that of Christology, uh, Christology, by the way, is just the study of Christ. Okay. Um, uh, the history is peppered with sophisticated ways to, to um, avoid this contradiction. Um, 
rejecting all logical contradictions. When we talk about a logical contradiction, we mean a sentence of the form um, uh, A and it's false that A where this is logical conjunction and that's logical negation or the falsity operator. Okay, so when I talk about a, a logical contradiction, I mean a sentence of that form. Okay, rejecting all logical contradictions. Uh, an a fortiori, any contradiction in our theology requires a rejection of this, that, or the step from these to this. And just about all of those options in many different colors have happened throughout the history of Christology. Um, the one view that has not been advanced uh, is the view that says, no, these are both true, just as Orthodox Christianity says, and indeed this, this follows. This is the view um, that I want to advance as contradictory Christology. Um, I'm not in position to argue that the true Christology is as I will say. That's a hard thing. But what I do want to do is defend the viability of it and give you some reasons to think it's plausible and not just say, hey, we got this logic, so why not? It's not like that. I think there's more to it, okay? The barriers in the way of accepting a logically contradictory Christology are built on an incorrect view of logic itself. <clears throat> and so what I want to turn to is a brief review of the role of logic in theology, okay? And then I want to give you the correct view of logic. Um, although I'm not going to really say a lot about this. I'm going to say a little bit, enough for you to get a sense of what's going on. But anyone who wants me to say more, it will be easy. So just sort of raise your hand and ask a question, and I'll do that, okay? But I'll assume that I've said enough otherwise. Um, the role of logic in general and the role of uh, logic in theology. I see the role of logic in general as being the sort of uh, universal, foundational closure operation or consequence relation um, in all of our true theories. Giving a theory of physics, um, your job as a theorist is to come up with truths about physics and then to systematize it by building a consequence relation that tells you from these truths, these also follow, and so on. Um, logic is at the bottom of all of those different consequence relations that you as theorists of different subject matters deal with. Christian theology is a theory of God, just as macrophysics is a theory of the macrophysical world, just as mathematical theories are theories of their respective mathematical phenomena, numbers, sets, categories, whatever. When we construct our theology, our theory of God, we begin by adding truths about God, including, for example, in this theory, that God is triune that Christ has two complementary natures, that God is omniscient, and so on, for whatever we as theologians, theorists of God, take to be true of God. Including, of course, truths about what God is not, what is false of God. For example, that it's false that God is limited, false that God is evil, etc. Uh, the source of our theory, the epistemological grounds, that's different. I'm just telling you about the theory, about what's involved in theory construction. I'm not talking about the epistemology of this, all right? When theorists aim to construct a true theory, they aim to construct as complete a theory as possible. In particular, the resulting theory should not only contain the initial thrown-in truths, for example, that God is triune, Christ has two natures, etc., the theory should also contain whatever follows from the truths in the theory. 
And this is where consequence relations, and in particular closure relations, uh, come into play. For our purposes, uh, a closure relation is a consequence relation, which is a certain kind of entailment relation. Sort of, you can think of it as sort of necessary truth preservation over some space of uh, possibilities. Um, and what you're doing as a theorist is first throwing in the truth, then constructing on top of logic how the consequence relation goes. Um, I, an example I use uh, too often is think about theories of knowledge, right? Um, uh, your theory of knowledge will be closed under a consequence relation that respects logic. So whatever falls according to logic, your, your theory of knowledge is going to say, yeah, that follows. But of course, logic is not going to tell you, um, let this be, it is known that, right? Logic itself is not going to tell you that from it is known that P, uh, P follows, right? Logic won't tell you that. Uh, that has to be something built into the theory of consequence relation. Okay. Um, and theology is no different. Theologians must not only add various basic truths about God, but they also must complete, as far as possible, the theory of, of God via a consequence relation. According to the consequence relation of true Christian theology, that it is false that P follows from any sentence P that claims the existence of a rival God, or etc. You're going to build in all these things that are going to be incompatible uh, with the uh, true Christian theology. All right. Let me make a note now. How much uh, time have we? Uh, 40 minutes so left. left. Yeah, left. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so th what I've been talking about is the role of logic in theology. It's the same role as logic has in any theory. It's just a sort of basement consequence uh, uh, relation. Now, let me take that as given that you understand. Is that clear enough? No hands? Good. Okay. Now let me just mention something about logic versus the standard account of logic, okay? Um, I think it will be very familiar here, but um, the standard account of logic uh, tells you that there are only two logical possibilities for any atomic sentence, and then for the sort of logic's truth operator, it's true that, and it's falsity operator, uh, logical negation, it's false that. Uh, there are only two, two real options. An atomic sentence can be true, it can be false. It has to be one or the other, and it cannot be both. That it has to be one or the other, um, given the way standard logic understands the falsity operator and the truth operator, tells you that for any sentence A, since it has to be either this or that, you're always going to have the truth of uh, excluded middle. That is, for any A, it's either going to be that, in which case that would be true, or if we explicitly use the truth operator, um, that would be true. If it's that, that would be true. It has to be one or another. So the way logical disjunction works, the whole thing will be true. So that's excluded middle. Moreover, so, so standard logic tells you there's a sort of exhaustion for any atomic sentence, any, you know, this is P, uh, F, G, whatever. It has to be one or the other. You get excluded middle. The, the so-called dual is the same. According to the standard account of logic, there, there are no atomic sentence <coughs> can be both true and false in a way that would make, so suppose that there is a sentence that's both true and false, then that would be true. That would be true. And given the way logical conjunction works, 
that contradiction would be true. Okay? So the standard account of logic tells you that can never happen. Standard account tells you you can have one or the other, but you can never have both. Okay. I take that as familiar. Moreover, that is the, the account that in general shows up in standard theology, okay? One where any atomic set is including, uh, well, let's treat this as atomic, uh, Christ cannot suffer. Um, that is not Christ suffers or something, or Christ can suffer. Uh, According to stand, the standard logic, this is either true, it's false, it has to be one or the other, it can be both. That's what you see in theology. Um, I think that there's good motivation outside of theology um, uh, for thinking that that account is just the wrong account of logic. If logic is the fundamental closure relation in all of our true theories, right, it has to accommodate the variety of phenomena, standard stuff, boring stuff, slightly interesting stuff, and really bizarre stuff. It has to accommodate all of that in the true theory of these various phenomena. The standard account of logic ignores the bizarre stuff. Um, in fact, it ignores a lot of stuff. If you think about the standard account, it arises from those really crisp uh, phenomena, like mathematics, where in mathematics, you know, every sentence is true or false, it's never both. Um, and so the standard account of logic works perfectly for that theory. But then you move to things like semantic paradoxes or vagueness or um, uh, theology. You move to these areas and there are bizarre things going on where the motivation for that sort of account of logic is just lost. A better account of logic is one that acknowledges the logical possibility of sentences that can be both true and false, and that can be neither true and false. Okay? So sentences that can be just true, just false, they can be both true and false, and neither true and false. Neither true nor false. This sort of account is one that is broad enough and natural enough to accommodate the role that logic itself plays in our theorizing. You might say, but once you have such a, uh, a sort of broad account of logical possibilities, you might say that we lose too much. Like what happens to classical mathematics if you allow for contradictions or you allow for gaps or something like this? The fact that logic allows for gluts, the fact that logic allows for gaps, doesn't mean that mathematics does. The true theory of mathematics, sorry to all the non-classical uh, mathematicians, <laughs> the true theory of mathematics rules these out as theoretical impossibilities. They are theoretically impossible given the correct theory of the phenomenon in question. If you're given a theory of uh, arithmetic, you rule these out. Why do you as a theoretician have to rule them out? Because logic doesn't. Logic is neutral on whether there are gluts or gaps in any domain. It's neutral. Theorizing is hard because you have to do the rolling out. On the standard picture, people don't even bother because they think logic's already done that work. But that's why the standard account can't accommodate the weird and lovely variety that we have in reality. It can accommodate some of it, not all of it. So let me repeat. 
that there are that there is a wider space of possibilities recognized by logic than the standard account makes for a weaker logic that is not as much gets to be logically valid many people say ah oh, that's why go so weak they think it's a problem it's not a problem in your theorizing you're always making assumptions you're making assumptions about what the best treatment of that phenomenon is and in your assumptions you are going to build in certain approaches maybe a certain phenomenon rolls out gaps just by the nature of the beast maybe it rolls out bloods maybe it rolls out both but it's not a problem that's just the reality of theorizing okay um so now that you have the clear true picture of logic let me turn are there any questions about what if i mean obviously i haven't defined the consequence of or anything else i'm relying on for those of you who know it uh, just a simple um, first degree entailment picture where you can have all these options according to logic importantly oh this is key on the standard account any contradiction according to logic will deliver as a consequence in your theory any sentence in the language of the theory all sentences in the language of the theory okay on the true account of logic this just isn't so because after all logic recognizes possibilities where um, that could be a glut it can be both true and false similarly though this won't be as important in what i'm going to say today there's what's called the, the dual principle according to the standard view of logic um, remember the exhaustion according to logic excluded middle has to be true in all theories um, in the right account of logic that's just not right because logic recognizes possibilities where a could be neither true nor false okay for our purposes this is key okay this is a mark of what people call pair consistency this is a mark of it sometimes gets called pair completeness these should be sharpened given certain theories but won't matter for our purposes okay um now how are we doing Perfect. Okay. Fun? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Here we get to the heart of the matter. Contradictory Christology. It should now be plain uh, that a logically contradictory Christology is not ruled out by logic itself. Okay? One must now ask why it should be ruled out. I think that it shouldn't. In particular, the key fundamental thesis of Orthodox Christology is that Christ has two apparently contradictory natures. The fundamental problem for Orthodox Christology is to respond to the apparent contradiction. While many sophisticated theories have spelled out ways to conceive of the apparent contradiction of Christ as non-contradictory, not really a contradiction, um, Few have taken contradictory Christology seriously. Think of Christ as the fundamental problem. Christ just is the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem of Christology is simple to see. The apparent contradiction is glaring when one looks at the, the, the truths according to the given theory. Orthodox Christianity maintains that Christ is the divine, omniscient God who also exemplifies non-divine human nature with its imperfect knowledge and imperfect understanding. The apparent contradiction is vivid, fueled by the foundational role of Christ in Orthodox Christianity. An omniscient being could not have our imperfect understanding of the pains and frustrations of our limited epistemic state. 
unless, and here is the problem, the being were not omniscient. The apparent contradiction fuels the pull of the so-called canonic tradition in Christ Christology, which, against Orthodox Christianity, puts priority on exactly one of the two natures. So you take the contradiction, there's this other heresy called canonicism. The canonic view uh, just rejects that, that Christ had two natures. It says, if there were two natures, you'd have a contradiction. Logic rules that out, so there aren't two natures. The other, the other heresy I talked about, um, it's called Nestorianism, uh, says there have to be two Christs. There have to be two people there because you get a contradiction otherwise. Logic rules that out, so whatever. Um, the pull of the canonic tradition, which, which uh, rejects the two natures, arises from the simple contradiction of Christ needing to be imperfect in his understanding and knowledge in order to have the experience of imper imperfect epistemic agents. But to be worthy of worship by, by humans, uh, Christ needs to be divine and perfect in his understanding and knowledge. The fundamental problem of Christology is then simple to see from the very role that Christ occupies in the worldview. Having the divine properties as, uh, as, as a God worthy of worship, but having the logical complement of those properties is what the ecumenical councils saw the role of Christ to be. On the logically contradictory Christology being proposed, Christ plays the foundational role of both having the features required to fully experience suffering as we experience it, while at the exact same time being worthy of worship and incapable, not capable, of suffering or imperfect understanding of su such suffering. The contradiction of Christ on the proposed Christology is not there because the various councils and expert theologians were sloppy. They, by the way, they say things like Christ is mutable and immutable. Christ is uh, passable and impassable. All in the same, you know, bet. They're not just being sloppy. Uh, so contradictory Christology isn't motivated by sloppiness on the, on the authors of those councils. Um, it's there because Christ's foundational role in the Christian view of the world requires something contradictory and thereby something extraordinary, unique, and awesome. Of course, if logic itself required that a contradiction entails outright absurdity, then contradictory Christology would be absurd and immediately off the table. But logic doesn't rule it out. Okay. In short, contradictory Christology responds to the fundamental problem by accepting the apparent contradictions as genuine contradictions. <laughs> this is not, and I want to repeat this, because too many logicians, especially non-classical ones, you know, they take a problem that everyone's been thinking about, and they roll out their, their toolkit, and they just say, hey, we got the tools. Just say this. I, I'm not doing that, or at least I, don't, I hope I'm not. I, I think that we should accept the contradictions, not simply because we can, given the correct account of logic, the view is motivated by the screamingly apparent contradiction at the heart of Christ's role, perfect God, but also as human in imperfection and limitation as you and me. On a mistaken view of logic, the proposed solution is off the table, but we needn't carry that mistaken view. All right, before I get to objections and replies, which are intended to fill out the position a bit more, can you tell me where we're at? 25 minutes. Perfect. I promise we won't go that long if you stop me. <laughs> All right. Um, before turning to objections and replies, I want to mention one thing to get it out of the way. Okay? The rarity of true contradictory theories. 
Before addressing a number of objections, uh, uh, let me get something off the table. The reason that we generally reject all logical contradictions is that they are ultimately very few and far between. This is a point that um, uh, glut theorists from Routley and Priest and others have said all along, and it's right, but it needs to be repeated. Well, actually, Priest and Routley <laughs> did try to push a lot of theories, so, but they said this nonetheless and we're right in saying it. Um, uh, so, so logically contradictory true theories are few and far between. This is why so few of our true theories, whoops, okay. Um, sorry, uh, logically possible contradictions are not ruled out by logic, they're ruled out in our theories. And we rule them out often without thinking because we haven't been given good reason to think that there are any in the, in the given uh, domain for the vast number of domains we work on. Standard mathematics rules out or blocks off the logical possibility of contradictions as mathematically impossible and so on. But in strange cases, extraordinary phenomena um, motivate contradiction. My proposal is not that theologians ought to seek out contradictions. The proposal is that Christ's unique role motivates a contradictory account. It's not, once again, that, hey, we have a logic that can deal with contradictions. Here's an apparent contradiction. Therefore, we ought to say it's a true contradiction. That's not the idea. The idea is that the given worldview is led by lots and lots of, of counsels on reflection to this apparent contradiction. How are they led there? They're led there by the role that this figure is supposed to play in the worldview. So my suggestion is, um, it's not that we're saying, hey, we have the right account of logic, it allows contradiction, so therefore, let it be contradictory. No. Just because logic allows something doesn't mean that's the truth. It means it's logically possible. That's it. In this case, the very role of this entity in the worldview, in the theory, demands two complementary natures. In order to play the role, the thing has to be as human as you and me, and all that human nature uh, entails. Moreover, the thing has to be as divine as, according to the theory, the unique God, traditional theistic conception, and all that that entails. And after lots and lots of reflection, the worldview keeps coming up with, it has to have those both. And yet, they keep struggling because they say, but Hold on, that's contradictory. So, contradictory Christology is motivated by the role that this figure is supposed to play in the view, uh, and it's allowed by a correct view of logic. All right. Um, let me turn to objections and replies. And there are eight of them, so if you want to count down. <laughs> Objection. Uh, the first one, from some to all contradictions. This one says, uh, objection. Once we allow some contradictions, we have no grounds to reject any contradictions. Reply, this is simply unmotivated. Consider the directly analogous claim. Once we admit that quantum reality is funny, we have no grounds to reject that all of reality is funny. For a lot more discussion of this, see lots of work by Graham Priest and Richard Sylvan and, and others. Um, okay, next objection. A bit more um, substantial. The objection is this, uh, historically sus suspect. Objection, the proposal is historically suspect. According to Gregory Dunn, a uh, scholar of of this uh, history of this uh, tradition, Leo the Great maintained that, quote, Jesus could be both impassable 
and passable at the same time without there being any contradiction, unquote. Hence, inasmuch as Leo's texts were ratified as part of Orthodox Christology, the proposed contradictory Christology is historically suspect. Reply. Two replies are in order. First, distinguish two senses of the word contradiction. One being a sentence, which is the logical conjunction of a sentence and its logical negation. The other being an explosive uh, uh, sentence. One that um, uh, implies, according to the thing, uh, absurdity. All sentences, okay? So there's a two sentence, senses of contradiction. One is just a formal sense. The other is explosive, according to the theory's consequence relation. The first sense is the one involved in the proposed contradictory Christology. And I agree with Leo and many others that the true Christology has no true explosive sentences. That is, no claims that are both true according to the Christology and also entail all sentences according to the Christology's consequence relation. So that's the first reply. I agree with Leo. It's just he was talking about explosive uh, stuff. Second, one needs to be careful in evaluating the account of logic involved in these texts. Um, so one can't just read Leo as automatically holding to classical logic. Um, it takes a lot of work to figure out, given the big body, which uh, account is right. Especially if you're not just trying to model, you're trying to take this stuff as true. All right. Next objection. Hermeneutically suspect. Objection. The proposal is hermeneutically suspect by being uncharitable in its reading of conciliar texts. These are the texts ratified by these councils, at least up through what's called the Council of Chalcedon, somewhere in middle 400s or 500s or something. Okay. Uh, Timothy Powell uh, implicitly argues that it's uncharitable to charge the writers of these councils with advancing a contradictory Christology. Let me quote from Powell. Powell says, had, they, had, they, had these people really believed uh, that these pairs of predicates were incompatible, they would not have affirmed that Christ is both in, uh, visible and invisible, as they did, incomprehensible and comprehensible, unlimited and limited, impassable and passable, inexpressible and expressible. By the way, those pairs are explicit in the uh, councils. It is a rare feat to be able to contradict oneself so forcefully in a single sentence. Any one of these five conjunctive pairs would be enough to entail contradiction. And the conciliar writers do it five times over, unquote. Powell's point is that it's at best uncharitable to interpret the uh, writers of the conciliar texts as advancing anything close to a genuinely contradictory theology. Reply. There are two big problems with Powell's argument from lack of charity. The first problem is that Powell's uh, hermeneutical argument comes with an uncharitable reading of the writers themselves. Either the writers use the key predicates, passable, impassable, mutable, immutable, and so on, in non-standard and yet undefined ways, or they use the predicates in their standard ways with their standard but glaringly contradictory consequences. The more charitable reading, as I see the matter, is the latter. They didn't just give you these brand new uses of the terms without telling you how they're being used. They gave you these terms in apparently contradictory ways and left it at that. They were using the terms as they're standardly used. On Powell's view, 
they used new terminology without ever even flagging that the usage is new. Uh, and that just seems to me the more uncharitable reading. Um, the second problem is that Powell's argument overlooks the possibility that these incompatible, <coughs> what he means is contradictory predicates, are precisely what is required for Christ to play the unique role that Christ plays. If, if that's an option, Powell's given no argument against it. Okay, next uh, objection, implausible. The objection, accepting that Christ exemplified a property and its logical complement is downright implausible. As such, the proposed contradictory Christology is itself implausible. Reply, if the objection is an empirical claim about what human believers can in fact believe, then the objection needs to be evaluated empirically. But there are philosophers who, in fact, believe of various entities that they instantiate a property and the property's logical complement. So, pending further empirical tests, such philosophers appear to be counterexamples to the sort of empirical charge of impossibility advance. So, it's just, you know, it's an empirical claim about any empirical support, in fact, with empirical evidence against. Next objection it's ad hoc. The objection. The proposal is just ad hoc. The fundamental problem of Christology is a difficult one to solve. The proposed uh, contradictory Christology points to an alternative account of logic that can handle contradictions without reducing a theory to all out absurdity. And then the proposal simply hitches the logic to Christology without independent motivation. Reply. This objection is misplaced on two fronts. To begin, the alternative account of logic has been motivated in the philosophy of logic by a wide range of, uh, of theology-independent phenomena, from concerns of relevance logic to modeling various inconsistent but not flat-out absurd theories and so on. So the given logic itself is not ad hoc. Uh, the second front on which the objection is misplaced is the charge specific to Christology, namely, the contradictory Christology is an ad hoc solution to the fundamental problem. This is just wrong. As far as I can see, the reason you have the fundamental problem is that the role of this Christ figure in the whole view demands a contradiction. They could have wrote in all sorts of clear ways. All the solutions to avoid the contradiction, dress all this stuff up, Christ qua whatever, Christ cannot suffer qua whatever, and all this stuff, elaborate. Those writing these texts could have done that. These aren't hard ideas. They didn't. They said, this is, this is the truth. And they said, by the way, it's heretical to think that the full truth is anything but ineffable. Uh, in the following way, there's one person, two natures. But how those two complementary natures come to be united in exactly one person is supposed to be ineffable. Now, there's all sorts of different ideas about what ineffable means. Uh, I think that it means you can't F the truth consistently. I think that's what the ineffability means. You can't say it consistently. This is what a lot of people mean by the thing. Why do they think it's ineffable? Because you get a contradiction otherwise, so you, it must be ineffable. So I think the usage of ineffable here is can't consistently uh, say it. Feedback on that would be nice. All right. Uh, how are we doing? Okay. Okay. Here's another one by um, a, a very uh, sort of based on work of an eminent uh, theologian and philosopher. Uh, objection. Coherence is a necessary condition for truth. And a coherent Christology rules out contradictory Christology, since a quote, a true list of Christ's properties cannot contain contradictory pairs, unquote. So I will leave it to you to reply to that one. Okay? 
Here's another one. Other theological contradictions. Objection. It looks like the proposed Christology naturally generalizes to other parts of theology. In particular, doesn't the general proposal require that every apparent contradiction in theology be treated as contradictory? Including, perhaps especially, the very familiar logical puzzles, including God's omniscience, omnipotence, a too heavy stone, and so on, uh, and the like. Reply, no. While logic leaves open such possibilities, and theologians should be aware of such possibilities, the contradiction needs to be motivated. While the familiar logical problems of Orthodox Christianity's omni-God are candidates for contradictory proposal, the contradiction involved is not as clear in, as in uh, the, the conciliar text um, and the fundamental problem. I don't rule out a contradictory resolution of other theological problems, but pending debate, my proposal is restricted to just this. And if you want the truth, I think that a lot of those are best dealt with. Um, there's an identity involved, and on my view, logic doesn't speak about identity, so more of the hard work of theorizing is giving an, an account of identity for the subject matter. Um, uh, but we can talk about that later if you want. Okay, uh, um, let me just skip one, go to the last objection. The proposed theory is not theology. <laughs> Theologians need not master the technical tools of contemporary logic in order to give a true theory of Christ, the true Christology or a true theory of any other theological phenomenon. The advanced theory, the proposed contradictory Christology, requires a mastery of just such technical logic. Um, reply. The viability of any Christology, not just that of contradictory Christology, relies on logic itself, on the logical consequence relation at the bottom of all consequence relations for our true theories. The view that theologians don't need to master, or at least be competent with respect to the given relation, logical consequence, is unmotivated. That theology is not about logic is absolutely clear and equally true. But theology needn't be about logic in order for logic to be of fundamental importance in the practice of doing theology. Theology relies on logic, and the theologians need to be aware of logic's constraints and more to the present paper, logic space of possibilities. All right. So here's what I've done in closing. There's this well-known fundamental problem in uh, Christology. This problem is very easy to say, see, and very easy to see that it's persistent. Look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of this tradition coming back to the same apparent contradiction. And that many years of attempts to get out of it. And each attempt to get out of it is one that comes too close to denying what is the core of the tradition one person, two contradictory natures. Um, well, flash. One person, two natures that appear to be contradictory. Fundamental problem is easy to see. It's easy to see why it's persisted. It's easy to see why you have all these very natural feeling heresies. Canonicism says there weren't two natures. Historianism, there were two people, uh, and so on. But they're all bound by a mis misconception of the space of logical possibilities. Uh, heavily influenced by Aquinas, was heavily influenced by Aristotle and others. Um, contemporary theology just takes standard kind of logic off the shelf and is bound by 
getting avoiding the contradiction. A correct account of logic uh, doesn't say this has to be true, but it allows for it. Then the question is, what motivation do you have for accepting the contradiction as the final truth? It seems to me the very role that this Christ figure is supposed to play in the worldview, that's what motivates it. That's what has motivated the apparent contradiction to begin with. The only reason that we keep saying, well, it's only apparent, is a misconception of what logic is. Um, there are a number of replies to this uh, view. I've gone over them. Um, uh, I think that none of the objections are very interesting, or some of them are interesting. Not all of them, uh, none of them are very uh, telling as far as a reason to reject this. Okay, so that's where we're at. Now we can do the 10 minute break if you want. Okay, so thank you.